big snafu today. I double booked. However, my original guest that was on I booked for the day was Mandy Barnett, which we had a great conversation. No, anyone that listened to that will never look at me in socks the same way ever again. But that's another conversation for another time, yes. right? Um, that all said, um, I also had booked another guest, and she could not make it. So Ethan, being the good sport that he was, decided to come on board. It's like, hey, we'll talk. It's like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about life, the universe, and everything in just a second. But I did want to say, um, because he is such a good friend and did this, um, he, he thought I when I got my original guest, because I did love my conversation with Mandy, don't get me wrong. Oh, I'm out. It's like, no, man, I can give you my word. Let's come on the show. So without further ado, he is the one, the only, Ethan James Marks. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, but I already have an interesting story for you. Okay. Um, so Ethan James Marks is the name I signed up on Facebook with, and that was in 2002, I want to say. So it's been a while, um, and it's a pen name. Ooh. Yeah. And uh, it's actually quite interesting because when I was in university, I did a number of papers that were related to the power of names, both in the reality and history of the human species and with um, fantasy and fiction and where those sort of intersect. Uh, it was for, actually, I did a number of papers. One of them was for a theology class. One of them was for a uh, speech class, which I got such interesting reviews. I have, I have the note around here somewhere where my teacher was like, you spoke on this subject and it was so enrapturing to me that I forgot to grade you. So I guess you get full marks. Um, but names are a big part of my life. And the, the Facebook name, as amusing as it is to me, is actually secondary to what I actually present myself to other people as, which is, um, my name is Shiv. I'm a fixer. I work for the government of British Columbia from time to time. But me, my primary passion is, um, working with artists and uh, solving logistical issues for, for people who are challenged by being in the wrong place at the right time or vice versa. Ah, okay, it's interesting you choose names. See, my name's also got power to it. So my name is essentially was also a prayer for me. My full name is Joshua Daniel Pentolaresco. So my first name, Joshua, is a prayer for strength. Second name, Daniel, is a prayer for wisdom. And my last name, well, that's just what I got, right? So now, now my last name is an interesting last name. Um, and it has an interesting origin. If you look up, there's an island called Pentelleria. So that's probably where it came from, right? So put that up, you'll find it somewhere somewhere over the rainbow. But, but, the, but there's also, um, my name is also Maltese. It's a Maltese name. Uh, you'll find a lot of my family is in Detroit. A lot of my family is in Australia, and a lot of my family is in Malta. So, there you go. That's a lot of the world. Cover a lot of bases that way. You get from oh, Ireland, yeah. intercontinental, it's all good. Yeah. No, so, I mean, so, my family, although although there's literally only, like, two million people that are Maltese in the world, so, I mean, we are a very small population. That all said, it is very, it is very, very interesting that uh, you're talking about names and power, and even in fiction. I always name my characters, all of them, on some level or another, just based on the fact that, uh, um, based on the fact that uh, they actually the name almost always ties to the story in some way or another, right? It either says something about them, or it says something, and it's ironic. The exception being um, my main character Corey in um, in uh, my court my very the Corey novels. She's got a basic human name, but the idea behind that was. In her case, she did a terrifying job for people. And because she did a terrifying job, I thought the most terrifying thing about that was an ordinary person can do terrible things. And I wanted that theme to come across. I chose a normal name with no special meaning because the meaning in that in itself was that anybody could become this. And that's an interesting literary approach. It's something that... Uh, works really well when you're trying to get somebody enticed into the position of identifying with your main character is to leave them with an opening where they can project themselves through that and into the, the space that character occupies. Yeah. It's uh, something I'm fond of with my own writing as well. Yeah, it, it's, it's a powerful little tool. It, it's, all, it's a very subtle thing. Not many people see it, but I don't need a lot of people to see it. It's just you need that, like, 
if one person gets the joke, like I win, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you gotta do those little things. So I'm gonna ask this one question because I know you are you are a fixer, a problem solver, which by definition probably makes you an artist of some sort. So have my you, moments. What? You have your moments? Yeah. Yeah, so, so what are those moments, if you don't mind my asking, since you are here? Well, well um, my mother was always very encouraging for our artistic sides when I was growing up, and she got us drawing, she got us writing, she got us playing music, she got us doing whatever we could do to see what clicked in for us. Um, I took a couple of courses in my first round of school, which was for video game design and development. So that sort of fits into its own category of like intersectional arts and multimedia. Um, but I took a, a Photoshop course at the time that was um, transcendental to everything that I've been doing with a computer until that point. So if I'm doing any digital media, it's uh, I'm, I'm relatively deft with Photoshop. I have a couple of art pieces that I've uh, made over the course of time. Um, but mostly I would say that uh, writing is what I do for artistic passion. I write science fiction, I write fantasy, I write horror, I write uh, mystery. Um, up until recently, it was a lot of disparate pieces that were not fitting well together until I realized in a bit of an epiphany that I had an underlying mythology that could bring everything into a same universe sort of experience, which has been incredibly motivating for me to keep writing because all of a sudden, instead of just scraps of whatever I feel like at the time, um, everything sort of comes in at a different angle to the same uh, core mythology that has let me um, tell a better and a bigger story. And it's actually been getting me more enthusiastic to keep writing. So I've been compiling a gallery of that lately. It sounds like you've discovered your own Eternal Two Champion series is what it sounds like. It's been uh, motivating, like I said. It's changed the way I feel about my writing and it's made me want to write more for myself, which has been a hard part of my creative process um, because I, like, I grew up role playing online. I've always had a co-writer uh, co to work with, somebody who was sharing in the creation process and contributing a sort of element of chaos to what we were doing that enhanced it. Um, but I haven't had contact with some of my collaborators for a long time just because life is, it grows and people are everywhere. Florida is a hard place to live. Texas is a hard place to live. Everybody's buckling down, particularly during 2020. And it's, uh, uh, leads you to your own devices at times. So being able to recapture my own independence with my writing has been pretty neat. So hard to get feedback, but okay, that leads to a couple of interesting thoughts. So, what I should I'll ask the big one. So, why collaboration? Like, why did you choose that as uh, instead of it? Most of us tend to go into our own thing and then we collaborate, right? And then our then they usually we become prima donnas again and kind of go do our own thing or something into that effect. Um, but it sounds to me like you collaborated first. Were you like searching for your own voice or are you just very happy working with other people? Um, well, a couple of, couple of areas on that, yeah. Um, like I said, I grew up role playing online. Um, some of my best friends are people who have reached out across tens of thousands of miles to save my life. Um, I've gone through some severe periods of trial in my life that I wouldn't have made it through without the input of people who were pretending to be someone else uh, to make a better story with me. So there's a lot of meaning to me with the shared experience that comes from that. Um, I am more of a storyteller than I am of a writer. I just happen to collect my words well enough to write them down. Um, but I'm not as driven to write alone and sit there banging away at a keyboard and, and not getting any pushback or um, inspiration from the people that I might share it with, which would come about if I was writing smaller pieces with somebody who was participating or talking in a format like this. So um, I feel like you lose a dimension when you're in a creative process. If you have nobody to share it with while you're committed to it, if somebody is writing music, they have somebody that they can play a beat for and that person will tell them, well, yeah, I kind of like your baseline. And if you have, um, 
pen and paper art, you can show a sketch to someone and say, oh, I really like this, but the hands are a little bit messed up. Um, but if you spend like 17 hours writing something and you can't really find somebody who wants to invest in that experience with you, then it's really hard to draw from what you've done the same sort of satisfaction of sharing and positive enforcement and encouragement that you would get from some of the other art forms. So it's it's a very complicated approach for a lot of writers. It, it takes either great skill or great volume to write a lot and get published. Um, I don't think I have myself put together well enough to do it alone, and I don't think I should need to. It's a hard is never alone. No, 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 no. I, I'm. It's just, it's just an important. You're not the only person I know that that does collabor collaborations. It's just one of those things where it's a rarer thing in writing. Not like not most other art forms. You, like comics, for example, are generally a very collaborative art form, right? Yeah. Usually a writer. There's usually an illustrator, a colorist, most of the time, although not always, and the letterer. So there's usually at least four people. Sometimes there's five. Sometimes there's eight. Sometimes there's just one. I mean, it, but it, that's a that's a that's a literary medium that tends to um, move, that lend itself towards collaboration. There's a lot of moving pieces in, in that. Whereas when you write a novel or you write a story, it's not unheard of. Like there's Mark Brooks, there's the Hickman, there, there's um, I can't remember who writes with Jake Kristoff right now. Oh, yeah, uh, Hoffman has their name, last name. I can't remember his name. He's notorious for just doing collaboration. That's all he does. Um, she's great at them. She's actually really good at them. But it seems to me like it, it's a rarer thing in writing. That it, That's why it hence the curiosity there. Writing is a torment. It's something that's crawling its way out of you through your pen or through your keyboard. And it's something that a lot of people don't have the don't have the relationship with someone to share that torment with unless they are inflicting it on them. So writing can writing is a very deeply, passionately ingrained sort of thing. And for a lot of people, it's solitary because you have to get it out in some way or another. Um, if you can find someone with whom you have the intimacy to collaborate and do it well, it's an entirely different experience to solitary writing. And it is often um, it's often parallels real relationships um with friends or family or emotional relationships because of it because you have more than one person who is pouring themselves into this unshaped mold and shaping the mold for the other person so that you establish boundaries and consents and um shared dynamics and versatility that makes something that you wouldn't be able to make on your own so and no it's, no, it's, no it's, it's true like i uh, so i i have said this on many of my podcasts one thing that I truly do believe is that what everybody brings to the table, it's not necessarily the story they're telling, it's how they're telling it, right? Because everybody has their a unique voice that cannot be duplicated, right? But in collaboration, it's much more akin to a symphony or a band. Yes. You bring, you each bring something to it that nobody else has. Because again, your voice is that you're unique. There will never be another Ethan, right? Just like the universe is probably saying, "Thank God, it's not going to be another me again." That's that's another thing all the way all the way around. But the thing, but the thing about that is, I have my own unique take, voice, thoughts, processes along those lines that literally are one of a kind. That all said, so do you. Now we might not think about quite the, the same things the same way. I like, for example, you might be much more meticulous in terms of how you do certain details than I would be. And vice versa, there are other details I care about that you don't, but they might not be the same thing. So what happens is we'll take the we'll get the same story, and we'll tell it completely different ways, right? So then the challenge then at that point is okay. So we have it's trying to make that almost like one voice or one one like harmony. Essentially, is we're trying to find a harmony in the story. And you try to make it sound like one unique voice, a voice you could not, you and I could not do alone, but together we create something different. Yeah, I'm, for example, I'm terrible with dialogue. Um, if you get people talking to each other in a scene, because of my background and my experience, 
um, I'm used to having somebody else write the responses to a dialogue. I can write my own, but having to take my own dialogue and then turn around and be that other person and write the responses in that dialogue, I have a lot of a, an easier time using descriptors. Um, I can put together the scenes for it and I can sort of like paint the picture around the words that are actually said to, um, to write the poetry of it. But the actual words are ones that I struggle with and often I'll leave them for like the later drafts because I don't have the time to write the right words at the time and have to, um, I write the setting. I write the scene, I write the underlying plot, I write the characters very well. But what they say to each other is something I have to like take back later and think on and have full conversations with my own characters between themselves as a, as a later edit to fill out the scene and make it worthwhile. Whereas somebody else with good dialogue writing would be able to take my context and make beauty in that space without having to struggle with it. So then, that's interesting because I, I like one thing I'm learning as as I keep going on in this is that every scene is a story unto itself. The mm -hmm. real, real secret is figuring out how these pieces tie together with the overall story you're telling, right? And doing it in a way that hopefully makes you feel something, mm -hmm. right? Um, that that that's the goal, I think. I don't know, but that seems to be the goal. That seems to be the goal a lot of the best, well-known bestsellers go for. It's, I'm going to take your soul one way or the other. I'm going to make you laugh, cry, feel. Or going to do that back anyway. Um, so I, I guess what I'm asking here is you're very comfortable with the storytelling of the setting, the storytelling of the character, which is I, which is where I actually struggle a little bit. Welcome back, Miss Jagtress. Welcome back. This is Ethan. He's awesome. And... Uh, and uh, we're talking actually about collaborations right now, and 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 all I'm about to ask him is, which is a fun thing. Um, what, I'm at, what I'm about to ask him is, it seems to me. So, what is it about the language of dialogue or the story of dialogue that makes it difficult for you? Is this the background, or or is it more? Um, it's just it, because it's not your first language, if that makes sense. Um. It takes a different part of my brain to write. Mm -hmm. I can't be painting the picture of the essence of the setting and be thinking about what a person would say out loud about it. When somebody's perceiving a setting to me, I can very easily think about what they would be thinking about that setting or the person in front of them, the character, the chalice of magic might or whatever it's gonna be. Um, but actually what they would say about it is a uh, different part of the psychology because you don't always say what you're thinking. You don't always say what you're feeling. Um, I myself often say random things out loud to keep people on their toes and confuse them um, or to give myself more time to think. But when you're writing something, you want to keep it punchy. You want to keep it up to a pace that is going to um, draw the reader's attention but not lose them from the details of what's going on around them. So it's a very hard balance to strike, and I can't think on those two sides of my brain at the same time. Oh, okay. So can I give you a, a funky suggestion that might help you? Absolutely. Um, I always take feedback. Yeah, comic books. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. Like the, thought, the thing about comic book dialogue, and the thing I really like about comic book dialogue is that it's short. Because mm -hmm. in bubble, you have a limitation of space. You have to convey information very quickly with your with with your dialogue, right? So even though it's not always how you would actually talk, although sometimes it is how you actually talk. Brian Bendis is not necessarily somebody, although he does incredible dialogue. It's not necessarily somebody I would start you with. Um, but a classic comic book, like you only have so many. It's almost like Twitter in that you only have so many characters to actually communicate a sentence with, but. I find like when in doubt, and this is how I this is just how I learned it, how to deal with dialogue is when in doubt, um, compress, make it as short as possible. Because what happens there is even though it may not always, it may not always, um, it may not always sound completely natural. It's much closer to natural because we talk in shorthand all the time anyway. We're always referring to other stories. So if you actually do and talk if you talk it like the you know, incredibly like in shorthand people will get it it will get the general gist and it won't 
feel out of, at the very least, it won't feel out of place. It may not sound like perfectly natural. You don't want to write perfectly natural. Uh, Brad Meltzer had a really great story about that once. I, I went, went to, a, he was at Poison Pen in Phoenix, Arizona, and, was there, and he told a story about how he's just going, I'm going to write dialogue exactly how people talk. Oh, there's lots of ums. So yeah, no, 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 just that, not just the ums and the ahs and the e's. No, it's like, hi, how are you doing? Good, you, good. It, 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 it was just this long thing. His friend, one of his friends, read it, looked at it, it's written garbage. So it's like, no, okay, listen. This is, this is good. <laughs> this was a good first try. This is yeah. how it actually works. No, and, and actually I do, I have a lot of comics in my um, inspirational bank. Particularly, I like um, graphic novels. I'm a big fan of Neil Gaiman. Uh, I liked Watchmen as a graphic novel, and it's split its pacing really well across a lot of different viewpoints, slivered that way. Oh, um, yeah. Watchmen's and genius. Oh, yeah. And Spider Man. Spider Man's super punchy. Um, but because I've got a lot of. Um, multimedia in my background from video games and from television. Mm -hmm. I also take comparators of things to do and things not to do. The opposite side of the dude talking the way a dude would normally talk that you just brought up is a show called, um, oh geez, I don't remember what it was called. Um, Gilmore Girls. Gilmore Girls had the worst writing for dialogue I've ever seen on a TV show, but it is the punchiest dialogue you could ever watch for slapstick comedy in a sitcom because they their pacing was like 90 kilometers an hour just spewing every line everybody had exactly the right response to everything there was nobody who was ever stupefied there was like more writing for that show than i think took place for the entire run of the simpsons as far as like just pure blather now it might have been a great show a lot of people really enjoyed it but it wasn't natural in any way which is funny because it was more supernatural, which is where half the characters ended up. Ooh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting, I don't know, I have so many places I could go with that. Um, <laughs> the Simpsons and Blather is an interesting one. I, I, I feel that, I feel like that if you take the first seven seasons out of the Simpsons, you take the first seven out, I think it's actually an, it's an even contest. The first seven seasons are being as good as they were because that was an incredible smartly written show in the first oh yeah season. no the writing for the simpsons is brilliant yeah it, it just ran a long time which is why i was using it as an example no i know i know i know no, no. It, it, it it was more brilliant then than it is now like now it's a lot canned yeah it, it's very eh. no hey listen we all as a creatives want the simpsons business model right we all want the business model of it we don't necessarily want the creative the result of said business model of it. I think. I think. I think the dream most of us have is we we want we, we want to we want to be like you know Brandon Sanderson because I say and I'm using that as an example because Brandon Sanderson writes these great wonderful world building things that are fun to read generally quite very fun to read and he's got something for everybody. If you want the big giant things? He's got the big giant things. If you got like the young adult stuff, he's got that too. And you want like like me silly he's got silly too right so depending on which way which way on the spectrum you go there's something for everybody we want that but we also want to make zillions of dollars in that. and very rarely i think does that go together in in, in, in that business it just it just it, it's usually it's really really good there's a formula to it that's sellable people get it because it's a formula that has been proven to work time and time again or very and and or it's really creative and it's brilliant and then years later it gets re gets revisited because it people realize just how good it was um it's very, very hard to have something i think it's it's very difficult to see that really awesome creative vibe right and it, it, it just at the same time. there are some exceptions though like as you know gaming which you did bring out so, there you go i think of it as a um a multi-layered sort of ecosystem. Writing is amazing because there's so many options for you. Hey, let's see some of my inspiration. Let's yeah, sure. I'll see some of your inspiration. Hey! Hi! Yes. This little bug is why I do a lot of the things I do. So so who, who, what's the little bug's name? This is Gwen. Hi, Gwen. Yeah. How you doing? 
She's doing pretty good. She's she's just over a year old, and she has changed everything in my life for all the better ways. I, I see that. I yes. see that. She's she giving her mom a hard time right now because I, uh, as we mentioned earlier on in the broadcast, wasn't sure I was going to be here just now. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. She is smart. I gotta say, listen, I can't compete with her. I can't compete with Gwen. Gwen lose wins. That, that just I under I would have if you said I want to spend time with my kid and that's your kid, I understand. I'll, I'll cry a little bit, but I under I understand. Well fortunately she's versatile and she does tend to pull the crowds. So what can Yeah, we say? hi. So uh, everybody say hi to Gwen. Hi. Say hello. Yeah. Yeah, she's watching you. She's like, who is this new? Who is this guy? I, I, my name's Josh. I'm silly. He's just joshing. Yeah, that's right. Just joshing with you. <laughs> she has it. She totally has. Yeah. So I mean, that's that. That is who she is. She's tired though. Oh yeah, she's uh, she's been playing all day. She's gonna take care of her mom. Ah. She does like to see her own face. She's her own favorite fan. Yes. And she's playing with her tongue right now. I know she is. This, this is awesome. She think that's a fun interview. <laughs> And she's smarter than I am by a league, so that's okay. That, I, I have, I have, I've, I've come, to, I've come to the conclusion that if I should have kids, they will be smarter than me and better than me in every way, and that's the way it should be, right? That's that's so that I've learned this already. I, I've accepted this, right? Things like getting my butt kicked in Call of Duty by six year old six year old kids have prepared me for that inevitability that when I play, if I do bring life into this world, it will be better than I was. Well, she's made a hard year much easier to deal with. Yes. She keeps me driven to do a lot of things. Go find your good. Go get your mom. Uh, you might remember that I left Facebook recently. Yes, it, yes, you did. Yeah. And before that, I was I had a daily routine where I would write a grateful thought for something from the day before. Um, and that was a mental health exercise for me. That was something that I my sister dared me to do in 2014, I think, um, said, yeah, I bet you can't write something you're grateful for every day for a month. And uh, I kept doing that for like six years because it just sort of kept on. Uh, but the context of it was that if I'm grateful for something for yesterday and I have to think about it the next day, then I take all of the things that I was stressed or frustrated from the day before out of my mind because I'm not thinking about them. I'm thinking through them. It really improved my ability to be uh, positive and to improve my my perspective on the world. Um, and that's something that I've kept up doing, except now I email it to its, uh, an address that I set up for her. And it's uh, something I intend to compile for her every couple of years is a, a summary of all the grateful thoughts every day to sort of walk her through the things I wanted to tell her on a daily basis. That's awesome. Like for me, like this time for me, I've been doing random things of gratitude to people at random. That's what I've been doing it. Um, I, I have found that, especially in a time like this, you almost have, like creating positivity is a really good way to dispel a lot of the stuff going on around you right now. It's a really good way of dealing with it. And I decided that for me personally that I would go to people, and I've been doing this even now throughout Christmas. I've been going to people, three people a day. For now, it's three people. A specific Christmas note about why I'm, I was really happy to talk to someone, meet someone. Or, or or interact with someone this year and things I'm really happy for and things I'm rooting for and it's, it's amazing just to watch that. Um, it's just a quick reaction for me. Is it because again I'm, I'm not writing for a kid. Oh, that's awesome, right? Like, you're actually doing that. Um, but what I found was like, like first of all, it makes me feel good because honestly, I'm saying something really nice. I'm saying a nice thing and but in this world, I'm putting something nice out there. But second, I can see the impact it's going to have. Your daughter, when she finally reads this stuff, she's going to be like, well, Daddy, you're very, very smart. She might actually say you're smarter than you give yourself credit for. I I like that you say that. Yeah. And I think that smart is one of those weird relative things. And I've definitely got a great big dialogue. Uh, my vocabulary is amazing. And my ability to come up with off-the-cuff remarks is very strong. Um, so I can't say that I'm not smart, but I'm hoping that if she continues on this path that I've seen her on, she's going to blow the world away. It's going to be amazing. And it's, uh, I hear a lot of parents say that, and you know what? 
frankly, if, even if I'm deluding myself, which I sincerely doubt, um, it's a great thing. It's a great thing to see the way she cheers her mother. It's the it's a, a thing that's been hard this year to find the right relief from the traumas of a society that's doing what it's doing to itself and uh, biology that's doing what it's doing to itself and an economy that's doing what it's doing to itself um, to have something that's so intrinsically human and simple as uh, family around you that you can appreciate is something I'm more fortunate than a lot of people. Oh yeah, no, it, it's it's something not to uh, lightly or for granted. I think I think what you have is, is it, it's again it's a hell of a motivator. Number one, number two, you're absolutely right. Like honestly, I think the biggest I think the biggest uh, thing you, if you believe you can make a big impact in the world, the biggest best thing you can do the way to do that is you have kids tell them. They can have a big impact on the world. Make them believe it. They believe it more than anybody else, and they will do it. I mean, that's I think the real secret to changing the world is believing that it can be changed. Yep, and uh, I look forward to the relief that will be provided from the younger people than me who are doing the hard work right now. Yes, and I intend to prepare her to be one who can bear that when she needs to. Oh. You got, you got, you, you got, you got to do, is she still there? Oh yeah. Okay. You can bring back if you want, if you want. Yeah. So I, so I got a fun story. I have one of my buddies from my high school. I'm still friends with him. We talked to him. So last time I went to visit him. So yeah, his, his kid was, is about eight, like I think eight or nine years old and she owns him. Like I, I, I've never, I've never, he growls at her a little bit. He, he, he tries to push her away, but she just she just wears him down, and eventually she gets him to do everything she wants him to. It's like <laughs> I watch him, and I'm like, dude, you got a good kid, and he owns you, right? And that's all, and that's all, and that's the way it should be, isn't it? Oh, I think so. I'm I'm gonna teach her how to get anything she wants. I've got a. I've got a very interesting perspective on moral awareness. That is something that my mother and father were very careful to raise me with. Um, my parents were fundamentally aware that deception is a reality that we live with. So we got points when I was growing up, if you could tell a creative falsehood, um, but it had to fall within a certain set of rules uh, that we had to learn as part of our, our upbringing. Um, my parents taught us to lie and to lie well, but they also taught us why people lie and what kind of lies there are and how to use lies to effectively improve a situation as opposed to just get yourself out of trouble. Um, and it was all part of an, in, like an intrinsic underlying don't do harm while you are improving the world around you if you can help it. Lesson. That's interesting because um I was taught the opposite. I was yeah, taught, I was yeah, well, no, 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 but but even more so than most. My my dad grew up to be was grip on the rougher of Detroit. You had to be a great kid, but you couldn't lie there because in that environment, the words you bond, right? Oh, yeah. you, right. If you don't, if you don't, um, if you if you break your word, um, you have no credibility. And once you once that's gone, right, you're done. Like you just that, That's really part of the lesson is that oh, you can't just lie. You can't, no. you can't use a lie when a truth will do. Mm. If you need a truth, you should tell the truth. And understanding what a lie is is something that you need to know in order to understand its value. So I'm going to ask this then, or since we're in this, what is a lie? For me, it, what, what, I, I have my own answer to it, but I'm curious what yours is. Uh, you want to get philosophical about it? I can go on at length. A lot. Yeah, we, so, we're, so we're here. For, we're here to have a conversation. So let's. This is where we've gone to. Let's go. A right. lie is something that falls into a bunch of different categories. You have, you have lies. You have falsehoods. You have misdirections. You have uh, deceptions. You have like there's. A, it's all a matter of the context of the situation that you are not exposing the full facts to the audience. Magic is a lie. Mm -hmm. um, 
sexual tension is a lie. Um, plot in a story is a lie because you don't tell everything up front. You might know something, but the disclosure of that something needs to come at the right time in the appropriate way for the appropriate impact that you need to make a situation work. Um, I work in software development. I work in um, business analysis. And a lot of the time, the deception for me is letting someone else speak their mind down the wrongest of paths so that we can explore that path and I might have known from the outset that that was the wrong path to follow. But um, getting to the end of it is integral for us understanding why it was the wrong path to follow. So lies are things that we need to execute in a way where we're having a dynamic between more than one person that not everything is given out at the front of it. The kinds of lies can be hurtful lies, they can be beneficial lies, they can be irrelevant lies, but what makes a lie have value or impact or risk or reward is the context of the situation and, and how much damage you are either doing or mitigating with whatever you're trying to accomplish. I know it's a complicated answer, but that's a complicated subject. Most people think a lie is anything that's not the truth. Truth is subjective and relative for a lot of people. People make their own truths. People have a truth that comes from a different perspective of what a situation might be. A lie is something that enables us to get to a consensus on something and protect ourselves from risk or protect someone else from risk or inflict damage on someone in order to get what you need. Oh, okay. Well, I, I I always think I always tend to look at a lie as a story, and and here and here and here's my take on it. Some of the examples we talked about: truth, everybody, uh, lies we all believe in, money, mm -hmm. money in and of itself has actually no value, but we all believe it has value because that's what we use to trade with each other, mm -hmm. right? But if you look at it, it's a piece of paper or it's a piece of data, it's information. It's, a little bit, it's even actually where it's less now. It's a bit of information. It's all yep. really money at the end of the day. So there's that. At but, least the Romans had salt. Salt yeah. was money because it was worth something. You needed yeah. it to live. I, 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 I actually see as salt as something a little bit more valuable than a bit of information, though. Salt actually has a lot of actually health benefits. That is, that is the argument for Bitcoin. That, that is the argument for Bitcoin there, Jack. That's totally it. I, but if you look at laws, our stories are constructs. Society is a construct, right? We've all agreed to live this way. I think the one the interesting thing that that as as brutal as this is right now, there is a, there is a quiet agreement with the majority of people to live this way right now. Yep. If we if we decide that tomorrow that we didn't really want to live this way, we would it'd be gone. It'd be over. It would be done. That's it. Right, that's the truth. Like, what? Like, right now, we can't go out and contact with each other because right now we we hurt each other. Whether that's true or not is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is, we believe it. Now, tomorrow, if I say we can go outside and we won't hurt each other anymore, like what the risk is gone. Well, that's not the truth. Whether or not it is true or not is irrelevant because that in itself, it's again, it's the story, the narrative that we believe is true. Yep. Right. That does not necessarily make it true. And if it's you understand deep. that, you understand the fact that literally not really a whole lot around us is true. It's a concept. It's the connective tissue between people. Yeah. And in order to get a truth, it has to be an individual's acceptance of something. A person has to be ready for it. And that's that's a really 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 fine line with a lot of people because we all we all have our own perceptions of what is real or what is true. I joke that about what is real because I don't know what real is. That might be the most honest thing I've ever said because that is that's a, that is because real is such a broad concept. How you define it? Right? That sounds like a movie quote. That's a good one, right? Um, Right, but that's the thing. Like, it's the one thing that almost none of us are taught, and it's, but it is the truth. You go out there long enough, you realize this. Everything, everything we have is by and large a construct we all want to exist. 
And the question really becomes is what do we really want? I actually say the one of the things I do believe is that everybody does exactly what they want no matter what circumstances. For example, I wanted to hug Gwen, and I can't blame you. She's adorable, right? But that's, that was that was the bigger one. That was the big one. But the thing is, we all do exactly what we want to do. Now, the only real question then is, what are we are we consciously controlling those wants, or are our desires they're controlling us? And I think there's all there's a constant. That's that's the real struggle. And if, you, if the desires control you, you can be manipulated to do, believe anything you want to believe. If you have a very specific want you have, right? Well, you're going to go find it and seek it no matter what. The diff- there, there, there's a difference of what controls the perception. Yeah. So one of my favorite writers and philosophers is uh, Carl Sagan. Okay. Carl Sagan belonged to a category of philosophical physics, astrophysicist, philosopher kings that were like, Richard Feynman and Carl Sagan and like there's a, a number of people who bring poetry to the math pure crunch math of physics and have brought incredible beauty through that um, but Carl Sagan um, in his cosmos series discussed the fact that the brain perceives and that perception is interpreted there is as part of our life experience not just part of our life experience if it's true or false that's different from fact and reality fact and reality are different things there's 12 fundamental particles there's four forces of nature there's a lot of things in the universe that we interpret but our experience is always going to be a lensed thing through the fact that our meat robot computer up here has to make what it will out of whatever it's fed so we're we the whole of human history has just been a matter of collaboratively coming to agreements on whether or not something was something and how that worked. Um, that means that everything, everything is a matter of interpretation of deceptions or truths. And truth only comes when you accept whatever is being put in front of you as probably the most likely situation to have occurred or to be occurring. So pushing all of that complexity off to the side. Um, when you ask me what is a lie, I would say a lie is the most fundamental communication between human beings. And it's the intent behind that communication that determines whether the lie is productive or harmful. I actually only think that's one part of the, equa- the equation. So I, I, believe, I, believe, I believe there's actually three parts to that equation. Intention, impact, yes. interpretation. And which, sorry, interpretation? Inter- interpretation. I, I, had, I lost, I, I had a friendship that kind of came to an end a few years back over something that really had an impact on me. And I realized that wasn't necessarily their intention. They really, and I realized at that point that I recognize, and I recognized something very, very fundamental about, fundamental about that. Their intentions can be good. I can't even debate that. I can't prove what, whatever their intentions are, their intentions are doesn't change the impact that moment had on me in that time furthermore right i can only go by then my interpretation of what happened in that event doesn't mean i'm right but it's all i got so what communication really what real communication is really about is coming to a consensus on the interpretation of the information presented that's what communication ultimately is in that consensus yeah conflict on it that also works yeah so, but like, but like, but like I said, I'm just saying, like intentions. I think intent. I I get why the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I really really get it because it's not enough because there it, it doesn't it 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 doesn't discount impact. But impact also is not enough. I can misunderstand something like that. Like we we are all we as you so eloquently put it, we all have our own lenses of seeing things, right? So and the, I'm biased. There's, there's no way around it. As you should be, it's a survival technique. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It it, it keeps me. It, I it, the ego is both a good and bad thing. It, it's a great thing because it makes you aware. It gives, makes you think about survival. It can be bad sometimes too, especially if I indulge it too much. But it, but it's used to be a tool. 
um, but it also means that there is room for error. And that, that is something that, um, and that's where interpretation is, I think, of the three, the most important. Um, but the real challenge then again is, is a willingness to understand, right? A willingness to learn, a willingness to be empathetic and communicate. And once that, if that ever breaks down, then you screw it. So there's going to be no, there can be no foundation. That, that gets into a lot of the fun theories about psychology with id, ego, and super ego. Yes. Which is a simplification, obviously, of the big machine, but it plays its part. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think that um, it all comes down to intimacy and trust. Mm -hmm. And one of the, to bring it back to what my parents' intentions were, their hope was to teach me that it was better to be productive than it was to be deceptive and destructive. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Um, probably one of the biggest lessons I ever learned yeah. along this line. I got caught shoplifting when I was like 13. Um, at the time, it just didn't occur to me that anything was a big problem with this. It was just me being clever with my hands. I could get what I wanted, right? But I used to stop in after school every day at a gas station and ask the attendant what time it was. And while she was checking the time, I'd steal a chocolate bar. And when I finally got caught doing this, the owner of the place picked me up by my shirt collar because he was like an eight foot tall biker at the time. Yeah. And uh, my mom came down and they didn't charge me with anything or ask me to pay for anything or do any work. But I remember my mom asked me to listen to what was being said. And the person, um, the, the owner was talking to the girl behind the counter. And she said, I can't believe he was stealing that whole time. He's been coming in for months. Was that all he came in for? And my mom said, look, you've taken this time to build this relationship with what is a stranger effectively, but it was somebody who cared about you enough to remember you and to think well of you and to spend time paying attention to you every day. And you spent months of your life establishing that relationship, whether it was a greater or a lesser intimacy, and you ruined it for plastic chocolate. You have wasted not just your time and your trust with me and with these people, but you've wasted an investment into another human being. And I never stole anything that I didn't need to steal since then. It laid out the impact of what that deception was and what that risk was and what the impact of that, whether it was intended or not, the thoughtlessness of it, put me in the mindset where I abruptly realized the value of a human's attention over paraffin wax and cocoa. I also don't eat chocolate anymore. Like, not bad chocolate anyway. Got to get good chocolate. Dark chocolate? Uh, no, I'm a milk chocolate person. You're a milk chocolate guy? Yeah. My, uh, my partner is a dark chocolate person. She loves the stuff. Oh, did you? I like the creamy milk chocolate, but Belgians are very nice. Swiss are very nice. So, uh, so for, for me, I got I, my 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 heart belongs with my parents. I'm sorry, just that 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 is just that's my thing. That's my that's my that's my bag, and I'm good with that. Um, but lots lots to think about there. Okay, so why does my show work? Like like I I I I, I it's a rhetorical one. Actually, I'll let you answer. What I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer, and I'll tell you why I think it works. We'll go that way. Uh, same line of thinking, because the care and intimacy that you put into the human relationships is something that everybody finds enjoyable, uh, whether it's the people who are participating or the people who are watching, and because it brings interesting new information to people who, for example, said, "Wow, that's an interesting message," um, might not have encountered that information otherwise so i think it works because it's um it, it's a slice of human experience that is very productive of yeah. course I'm reading. of course he's reading you the message is the message is there to be read you have been discovered you've been aware the whole time <laughs> Ooh, we have a burrower i'll have to get the boxes i'm going to say this i'm going to say something very nice about jacob before i answer this question he is sweet She's one of my favorite people to read my stuff with because honestly, she eviscerates my work, but she makes me better, which I appreciate. Anyway, there's Bitter a relationships. Love it. Yeah. Now, that all said, here's the, here's, here's, here's the, here's the secret. I, I realized this about, 
I realized that when Dwayne Clayton came on the show and actually and talked to me about his PTSD from a cop being a cop, a fireman, and, and, and an EMT, I'm trusted. I have put enough investment into the show and to be meeting so many different people, and I've been so genuine with so many different people that I'm trusted. And I don't, that's what it should work. I had a conversation about stocks. I'm sure Jag, Jag will, t- will tell you will tell you about that on another time. I can be silly, I can be serious, I can be philosophical, but it's all coming. It all comes from a very genuine place, right? Um, and because of that, whoever's listening or whoever's on the show, trust me. And if I ever lost that trust, the show would fall apart. That's the basis of my relationship with most of the people that I work with. Um, I work with vendors uh, at comic expos mostly. Um, it's something that I started uh, through a mutual friend of ours, actually. Um, Peter Chikowski is somebody that I started working with like 10 or more years ago. Um, I started working with him and I started working with the Blind Ferret people at a Cal- Calgary Comic Expo. and. I realized that the only way that I was ever going to get anything done is if they could believe me when I said something would get done. If they could put faith in the people that I supplanted for myself when I couldn't do it myself, um, that there was a faith that if something was needed, I would be the person who could solve it. No, I wasn't with Blind Ferret. I was working with their back end folks, setting up a couple of shows. Um, but I am good friends with a number of their staff. Um, my my role as a fixer at shows evolved over time from being the guy who helped break down after a show to the person who would run $5 bills to different booths because you always run out of cash. Somebody's paying with 20s and you can't make change with a 20. No. Uh, somebody who would make sure that the diabetics had their food so that they wouldn't die of blood sugar issues. Uh, somebody who would make sure that the vegans had their food and their um, the celiacs had their food. Everybody was safe. Everybody was uh, able to do what they needed to do. Um, I really stepped it up one year after a friend of mine had her booth stolen out from under her at a show because she had to go to the bathroom. And when she left to go to the bathroom because she reached the end of her tether, somebody walked behind her booth, folded all of her stuff up, put it on a dolly and left because nobody thought that was abnormal. Somebody is always there helping people pack up. She lost her entire investment into that show because she needed to be a human being. And so after that, I made sure that there was always somebody who could take over for someone who needed to go to the bathroom, that the people who worked for me were trusted enough that anybody who knew of my reputation and credibility would put their livelihood in our hands. And that's something that I've always been proud of is that the people that that's fed into my life have been trustworthy people. Uh, they've been versatile people. They've been interesting enough to engage across the table. They've been, um, they're usually people who have social anxiety and that's why they wanted to go to the show in that context is because it puts a barrier between them and all the other people there. And surprisingly enough, these social anxiety people do well at sales because there is a, you know, I, I work in retail because I have to survive. So this desk is comfortable for me. Um, it let me give a lot more opportunities to people who wanted to share a human experience through that. And the enrichment that I've gotten from the different characters I've met has fulfilled what you're saying is, um, yeah, you know that trust has value because you know what the consequence of a lie is. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what makes it break it. Like that's the, that's the foundation of every relationship. It doesn't matter what kind of relationship you have. If you have trust, you can have a good relationship with anybody. Hell, you can have a contentious relationship, but if there's a trust there, it will last. Mm-hmm. When that trust is broken, that you once you want to destroy a trust in a relationship, and that's it. It's done. It's oh, yeah. impossible to get it back. Um, it can be done, but that is such a hard road. So. And you might not even like the dynamics of a relationship, but if you have a fundamental understanding of how someone is going to pull up to the table, whether you like them or not, if you can trust them, you'll work with them. Yeah, exactly. No, if you know exactly that, that's it. You, you figure out what works, and that and that's actually that's the secret right there. Um, yes, actually, that's, that's most people. That's most people. That you, most people once trust is gone. That's it. It's over. It's that important. It's that. It's that tenuous. It's that fragile. 
right? Every relationship, no matter how far along you develop it, if you break trust, it's over. It's gone. It's the currency of the human mind. It is. Totally. It's the only thing that matters. It's actually one of the only two things that truly really matters. So, um, but that, that is what you said. So, let's go, let's go back to to your books. Are, are your books out? I, I want to ask that before I read. I wrote a book when I was young, much younger that got published like 50 copies of a kid's book that I don't have any more and I couldn't tell you what was in it. Um, but I have a lot of unpublished scrap work that I've been working on um, that I just sort of keep and share. I'm happy to provide a link if you would like to read any of it. Um, but the majority of my stuff is I have not had the confidence to publish it because it is so um, constellation. It's coming in from a lot of different points and there's not a lot of collectivism to it. So I, you know, I might put out a short story anthology or I might create an underlying mythology that lets me tie everything together and eventually write a real book, uh, which is nice. The, um, the only piece that I can think of that might be published anytime soon, I did enter the Canadian CDC short story writing contest with one of my more widely well-received pieces, um, which actually is strangely enough, largely based around dialogue. So I'm just I'm just reading, I'm just reading what, what you just what you just said there. Yep. Yeah. But uh, no, sounds like well, it sounds like you're getting ready to go for it. Um, would you try? Are you still more comfortable with smaller stuff? Would you try something bigger at this point? I would, and like I said, I've been working on the different angles to it. The the wonderful part of the project I've been working on lately is that. I've got a start point, a bunch of middle points, and an end point. And instead of trying to write it linearly, just because um, the nature of it is so spread out, I have the chance to wait for an inspiration to hit me and write something that could be like at 96% through the book, and then something that's 75% through the book, and then write something that's 32% through the book, and then write something that's 78% through the book. And then like edit something that I've already written. And um, it's given me a lot more freedom to holistically and organically put together this weird sort of environment. Um, but a lot of it has been world building. And world building is fun because every time I sit down and I create a god or I create uh, a realm, it provides me the tools to be inspired by myself later. Um, so. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I wrote a little story about a teapot and the teapot was, uh, it was a genie binding. And the whole story came down to a merchant was hired to acquire a bunch of very rare artifacts from, it ended up being other realms, which made it fundamentally impossible for this merchant to collect all of these pieces that he swore he could collect. And the person who commissioned him to get those knew this and he did this so that when the merchant failed to be able to deliver, he would swear an oath and that oath could be bound by the teapot and he turned this merchant into a genie that basically served him. Um, this is something that's just a one-off. That's one dude sitting in a tower over a chessboard pouring tea in a desert, talking to a merchant about him screwing up, getting things like, you know, tears from a Hydra and stolen Nazi gold from another universe because it's not where it's on Earth, right? Um, and this is something that because I figured out the formula to tie it back into my story, I can take those characters and those scenarios and put them into my, my plot as in an encounter and use that material later, despite the fact that it would have been uh, scrap one-off previously. So I'm very excited about my ability to pull this eventually into a an actual full piece and it's caught some attention i've had actually surprisingly enough uh, one or two artists who were talking about hey man i really like your writing and i can't get my head around it can you train me on some writing because i'm trying to do a graphic novel and maybe we'll trade some skill sets and i like that that's exactly what i want to do well i'm actually starting my first graphic stuff very soon myself um yeah, I, 
actually, Jay Gomez from the Jags said, "No, it, it, it actually really is. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, sometimes you gem, you find gems in your scraps, and they come out late years later, even years. The stuff I wrote when I was a kid that is still coming out now. So, but going back, so okay. So I got one last question. I think we'll wrap this interview up for now. I think we could talk for a long time, but I, I do feel." You do have you do have the star of your attention over there, and I don't um I don't I, I, I can't win that battle, and so I'm not even going to try. But um I was thinking you're a very cerebral guy, very very cerebral guy. It happens. It does happen. Yes, it does. But I do think this is this is this isn't this is a question. Um, a question I, I basically I'm just listening. You, you say a lot from your head. There's, a There's definitely a passion to what you're saying. But I'm listening I'm listening to you too. Like if I ever talk about your story, like what you what your story is about, what you're actually trying to say. What would your answer Because I, I mentioned this in the other I, I mentioned this in other like, stories about my life stuff. And I'm kinda curious about what that would be to you. Well it's interesting. Um, the thing that made me able to collect all of these pieces into something that was more of a unified storytelling than a bunch of scattered pieces uh, was the idea that I could create a universe that wasn't based on physics the way we understand it. Still needed them. But the reason that everything in this setting existed was because chaos and infinity got bored and wanted to tell stories to one another. So the entire underlying law of this reality is that um, time occurred in order to allow finite things to happen in an infinite space. And that explicitly was done so that people could tell stories to each other. And so everything that's taking place in this is, is built around this these 10 principles uh, deities, I guess you would say, in the setting of um, storytelling, um, inspiration, who, what, where, when, why, and how. They're all gods. These are all um, factors of creation, and they're being hunted by oblivion across time. Oblivion is consuming time behind all of these storytellers because oblivion felt robbed when they started telling sequels because it stopped having endings. So a lot of my meta telling is, um, to bring us back to our first point of names being important, um, and to bring us to our last point of the interpretation of the human mind, it's important to me that the reality we inhabit is a bunch of labels and a bunch of collaborative storytelling where what we get out of things is going to be whatever we write into the plot as we're building it together. This is why the productive stuff that my parents brought up in me was important is because if you're gonna invest in this universe that we live in, if you can't make it a positive investment or an inspirational investment, if you can't have your heroes bearing up a chance to win and your villains a chance to reform, then you're doing a disservice to the reader, you're doing a disservice to your collaborators, and you're doing a disservice to yourself because you're only bearing negativity into whatever you're doing. So when I write, my hope is that I will move people to feel things that they would not otherwise have the chance to feel, experience things that they wouldn't have a chance to experience, but in the end to feel like no matter how many ringers I put them through, there's a hope that they will come out the other side enriched and with an opportunity to add value to their own lives. Hmm. So your, your daughter's one, right? Yep. I, I could ask that question, but we're kind of near the end of this conversation, and that would uh, that would put to not, uh, add another layer to this conversation. <laughs> How about we do this, Ethan? Would you like to come back around February or March? 
Sure. Uh, okay, I'm, already, I'm already booked a little bit that far in advance. Yeah, absolutely. As long as we don't have like a zombie plague or something. No, no, uh, uh, you know, there's a zombie plague, whatever. What the fuck? Like, yeah, we make time for the important stuff. And I think it feel like even in a zombie plague, communication is close to involved. That just, maybe I'm crazy, but I'm good with that. Um, but. Just but I, I, but it, I, the reason I ran your daughter, I'm going to be very curious when we, um, um, when your daughter is two or three. This, this is just an observation. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, and, and if I am, I totally nod. I totally think you, my friend, have your, your, the gears in here are very finely tuned. Right, I, I feel I feel like you, you kind of know what you want to say, right? But when I look at your how you look at your little girl, and I look at how you describe your stories, when you get to that point where I, I know you're going to be like the big hit, you really, really, really. Um, when you can talk about these stories with almost the same, I think the same love. You're like obviously, you're gonna love your daughter way more than these stories you tell. But I feel your heart is more out out there. When she's around, than when you are in telling your story, and that I, I that maybe I'm wrong on that, but well, just um, I, I just I feel that it was because of what she brought out of you, what she brings out when I when I see you two, yeah, you're going to be an amazing dad. It's going to be an incredible. You're going to be an amazing dad, but I also think you're going to be able to bring out more parts of yourself that you're maybe not as comfortable revealing right now as time oh, yeah. has come on. When and she was first born, I had trouble singing because she had trouble understanding singing. And yeah. I had to like get that through my head. It's like she she's listening. She might not understand, but she's listening. So start singing. Yeah. I, I so I'm like two years from now, like two years from now, I'm gonna ask that question to you again, I think. Because I think it will have evolved a bit. Yeah. And yeah. I'm lucky because I know I know that I'm a ball of anxiety and overstuffed knowledge and experience and jaded insanity. Like I'm, I'm a wreck. Let me tell you what, but she's not, she's brand new and I have the entire rest of her life to learn from her. And that is the best blessing that I have is that I don't have to fill her with what has wrecked me, even if it's wrecked me in an interesting and productive way but i do get the opportunity to help bring context to her experiences and live through her unique perspective on the universe and that is something i look forward to giving me peace no i agree i agree jack he's not however i get where he's coming from too i think i understand it yeah um I don't really know where, where to go from here on the interview. I think this is a good spot to walk away for the time being. I think. Do you, do you agree? I think this is a good spot. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that should be noted. I'm a happy wreck. Don't worry. No, 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 no. I, 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 yeah. I, 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 I get it. I totally, do. I, I, I totally get it. I, I totally do. Um. Okay. So we talked a little bit about you. So why don't you also talk about the place where you, people can find your, find your writings if they want to find it, and where people can find you if you if there's anywhere you'd like them to find you. And we'll wrap up. Well, my name is Shivrail. As far as I know, I'm the only one. Uh, S-H-I-V-R-A-E-L. My main um, repository of writing right now is on DeviantArt. So shivrail.deviantart.com. Very easy. Um, if you want to get a hold of me to talk, I am always available through my email address, which for the nerds out there who love that sort of thing is 404findme at gmail.com. You'll get responses from Carmen San Diego. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Where in the world is I love that show, Mr. Kid. Oh yeah. I love that show. It's one but, of the first video games ever to come out was Carmen San Diego. Yes, it was. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic I, I, I that, but that song will be in my head for the rest of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Ethan James Marks. This was a bonus episode of just joshing. Um and I want to thank everybody that came and watched this one as well. Ethan, you were awesome. And I, I'm glad you filled in, like, like filled in for me. I, you know, you know, it turned out I double booked myself. I feel this conversation was worth it. Um, I, the first one made you laugh. This one makes you think. Is anyone? And actually, I can't think of a better way to do a just dropping show. And um, 
For those people that are watching right now, if you want to subscribe to the podcast, I am on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Chris Joshing Podcast. My YouTube channel is Joshua Pentelaresco. If you want to buy my books, they are Alice Zero and The Cloud Dyer, available on Amazon right now. Ethan, you're awesome. Guys, tomorrow, Joe Compton. You guys stay inspired out there. Keep shining in the dark. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Oh.